tonight, a mystery still alive after a thousand years. In the Middle Ages, this was almost like an Agatha Christie. An enigma to rival the Da Vinci Code, buried in ancient parchments. The story of a woman who disguised herself as a man and won the throne of the Catholic Church. A woman who became Pope. That she then reigned for two and a half years as Pope John Anglicus. We bring you the clues in the mud of barbaric Germany, in the heart of the Vatican. We keep hearing that right here in the Vatican, there is evidence that a Pope Joan may have existed. We will show how her existence was chronicled in church histories. The antique tarot card of La Papesse, the female Pope. The marble carving at the altar of St. Peter's itself. A woman's face under a Pope's hat. There are certainly over a hundred rooms in the, in the Vatican secret archive. And we try to penetrate the Vatican Museum where we're told they house the most bizarre clue of all. A chair as old as its secrets. Was it used to test the manhood of new popes? He would put his hands under the chair to verify the sex of the pope, and he would say, ah, but, uh, he has them. That's a mighty weird custom, if there was never a female pope. Amid the clues, the controversy, denials, and from scholars, ridicule. I don't see any proof or an indication that she really did exist. But something whispers across the years. If it is myth, is there a meaning? And is it possible that we've found the street where the imposter pope was finally undone? We take you to what they say is the scene of her scandalous unveiling. Can it be a pope giving birth? Legend, fact, fantasy. Tonight, the astonishing tale ripped from a dark age headline. The woman said to have become the Holy Father. The mystery of Pope Joan. Good evening, I'm Diane Sawyer, and we welcome you to this special second hour of Prime Time. The mystery of Pope Joan, a tale so intriguing Hollywood is already casting the movie. A story so amazing you may wonder why you've never heard it before. So let us begin as we take you on a journey into one of history's great detective stories back through the dark ages, back through the mists of time. It is a story as old as the cobblestones of Europe, as immediate as any woman's ambition, any century's dreams. Come with us back more than a thousand years to 800 AD. The timeless Rhine River rolls through a 9th century German town called Mainz. Here, the homes were usually mud huts. There was borderline starvation. Life was brief and brutal. Probably not more than 30 or 40 years was the average age that Europeans were, could expect to live. We haven't the foggiest idea what the poor were doing, and that would account for most of society. They were treated like animals, you know, and probably had no choice but to act that way. In fact, most people didn't even have last names then. Why would you need them? You never left the tiny village where you were born. Yet it has been written by more than 500 Catholic historians that a young girl who lived here could see beyond a life of gathering food and exhausted childbearing. She wants more. What did she look like? No one knows, but perhaps a girl like those memorialized in centuries-old paintings, eyes alive with intelligence. Or perhaps a girl like those of today, faces shining with curiosity and daring. And remember, this is not just a fairy tale. It is one of the world's oldest and most fascinating puzzles. So decide for yourself as we follow the clues in sculptures and art in literature and church galleries. From a bizarre coronation chair behind closed doors in the Vatican, to the ancient parchment stored in libraries all over Europe, which is where we begin. Carefully open the books written by centuries old monks and the words unfold an astonishing tale. A female Pope, they write, who is not set down in the list of Popes, 
who, by an occurrence of wonderful audacity, was made pope. Joanna, a woman, for which reason she does not bear a number to her name. What to you is the single biggest, most nearly solid rock you've got at the center of this? The thing that you yeah. think is the most persuasive? I would say it's the weight of evidence, over 500 chronicle accounts of her existence. Donna Cross is a novelist who spent seven years researching the time period. And her story is told largely by Catholics. Often Catholics very highly placed in the papal hierarchy, very devoted to the papal see, so that the question of motive arises. Why would these men make up such a story? And again, for hundreds of years, this was the undisputed account written by church historians. The tale of a ninth century girl who defied what would have been her destiny. Mary Malone, a former nun who has written about women and Christianity. No woman would have been allowed to appear on the streets in public. That named you as a prostitute immediately. Uh, like women were confined to their homes. A man was absolutely permitted to beat his wife to within an inch of her life. Later, folklore would give us a phrase, rule of thumb. The stick for beating should not be wider than a thumb. The only law in the books was one regulating the size of the club that the husband or the father could use. So what could have stirred such a girl to look beyond the horizon in this harsh and pagan land? A new religion? Christianity, brought to her town of Mainz by English missionaries. We know that they created a place that might have awakened her dreams. It once stood on this spot, Fulda, a monastery with a library, a center for education, books, teachers, travelers, conversation, if you were a boy or a singularly daring young girl. She would have had no real alternative if she wanted to be anybody or do anything other than to have disguised herself as a man and to enter some center of learning. Fulda was quite near her, and Fulda had one of the most famous libraries at that time in all of Europe. It was an opportunity, and she took it. But this would have been a deception punishable by death. How could she live, bathe, and keep her secret? How could she do it? How, how, could, she, how could she get through 24 hours? First of all, you want to remember that clerical robes are very body disguising. Also in the ninth century, Personal hygiene was non-existent. Nobody bathed. They washed their hands, their face, and their feet, but they didn't bathe. Add to that the fact that in Europe, clergy were required to be clean-shaven, and malnutrition made most women and men gaunt. But again, don't take our word for it. The ancient parchments continue the story, saying this woman learns the languages of scholars, Greek and Latin that she excels at her work and becomes, quote, proficient in a diversity of branches of knowledge. And not only that, imagine her traveling to Athens to learn science. And then the documents add a plot line a novelist wouldn't attempt. And imagine something else. She has a lover who helps her make the journey to triumph in Rome. A lover? Again. The chronicles say she was, quote, led to Athens dressed in the clothes of a man by a certain lover of hers. Karen Jo Torgerson is Dean of Religious Studies at Claremont University. There's evidence on both sides. That's what makes it so difficult. There's evidence for her historical existence and evidence contesting that. 90% of me thinks there was a Pope Joan. I had assumed that the story of Pope Joan was a legend and now I think there may be some historical credibility. Joan is just one in a long line of people, of women, who always needed to know, needed to learn, needed to study, and had to do whatever was necessary to do that. Including an unthinkable ninth century journey from the countryside of Germany to a monastery to Athens, and from there to power and ruin in Rome. When we return, more clues. Is that Pope Joan's face at the altar in St. Peter's? Is that her face in a gallery of popes? And what about the chair said to test the pope's gender? The mystery of Pope Joan continues. If you're like us, you're shocked to realize that you haven't heard the story of Pope Joan before. 
But as we discovered on the streets of Italy, it just shows you're not a Roman. He's a legend. You know that He's a legend, sure. Many, many years ago, there was a female pope. Mm -hmm. But have you ever heard of a female pope? Si, si, una cosa vecchia, risavuta. Very old uh, news. Pope Joan, have you heard the legend? And yet, try asking those questions to some nuns and priests, and they shy away. After all, take a look at the hierarchy of the Catholic Church today. Women resolutely excluded from true circles of power. But other Romans urge you toward all the clues embedded in art and literature. For instance, look here, the book written by the Renaissance poet Boccaccio, author of The Decameron. It's called Concerning Famous Women, and number 51 is Pope Joan. Or wander into rare book dealers, and they pull from their shelves early European tarot cards like these. In the major arcana, the card for hidden knowledge, La Papesse, the female pope. And we pursue yet another clue far outside Rome, north in Siena at the cathedral, the Duomo. Inside, there's a gallery of terracotta busts depicting 170 popes, all jumbled together, not in order. We know that in the 17th century, Cardinal Baronius, the Vatican librarian, wrote as fact that at one point, one of these faces in the Duomo was female. The statue of Joan, which stood for a couple of hundred years in the Cathedral of Siena, right alongside the other popes, Johanna, Papa Femina, Joan the female pope, but that same Baronius says eventually a Renaissance pope ordered that the statue be destroyed. Though according to legend, the local archbishop didn't want a good statue to go to waste. The statue transformed. I mean, literally, it was uh, scraped off her name and written on top of Pope Zachary. There it is, Pope Zacharias, a pope from the 700s. Is it a face more feminine than the others, than these? We couldn't get any closer. We know this was scraped off. You can see it's the what evidence it is said, of it. And right around 1600, I think it is. Um, the statue was changed, metamorphosed, from one of Joan female pope to Pope Zachary. If true, you know this is one of the earliest examples we have in history of a sex change operation. So we wondered, is this really a portrait of a girl who once studied in Athens, according to the Chronicles, her lover by her side? A girl who became, quote, proficient in a diversity of branches of knowledge until she had no equal, who had great masters among her students, and then made her way to the riotous city of Rome. A Rome nothing like the solemn and civilized city and Vatican today. Simple brick buildings with dirt streets in between people getting about by, by horses and by walking, a lot of mud, a lot of, of dirt. It was a dark age time of bawdy monks, scheming cardinals, even cross-dressing saints. We'll tell you more about them in a moment. A city of deadly intrigue and melodrama, corruption, assassination, even in the holiest office. Popes killed each other off and hammered each other to death. You have a, a pope who is dug up and put on trial as a cadaver. Popes that are thrown into the Tiber. There were 12-year-old popes. We have knowledge of a five-year-old archbishop. It was a very odd time. Which meant it would have been a time of opportunity for someone with ambition and nerve. Again, those 500 chronicles say that's how a woman became secretary to the Curia a cardinal, and then the choice of all for pope. Her papal name, they say, John Anglicus. In other words, English John, perhaps a tribute to the missionaries who brought Christianity to her hometown. That's why, eventually, she'd be nicknamed Pope Joan. And as pope, she would have been the most powerful figure in Italy, with the political clout to crown and sometimes excommunicate emperors perceived successor to the Apostle Peter. The date of her reign said to be 855 AD. And if that was true, she might also have been a woman for her time. There are over 30 saints' lives in which women dress as men for a variety of reasons and with a variety of outcomes. 
medievalist Valerie Hotchkiss, who doesn't believe the legend of Joan, but says cross-dressing women were a feature of medieval tales. She has written about the transvestite nuns who were celebrated in the centuries before and after the Chronicle of Joan. But they're all saints, which tells you something about the phenomenon. There was Saint Eugenia, who was such a convincing monk, she was brought to court on charges of fathering a local woman's child, proving her innocence only by bearing her breasts. There's a well-documented case of a woman named Hildegund von Schonau who died in 1188. Hildegard, who traveled to the Holy Land and lived a long life disguised as a monk. She was used to being a boy. She'd been a boy since she was a little girl. <laughs> that sounds funny, but... Her secret was discovered only when her body was being prepared for burial. Any time a woman went public, she had to disguise herself. It was dangerous. And as we know from later on in the Middle Ages, when women went public to preach, many of them got burnt at the stake for their trouble. So is it plausible that Joan was just a girl following in a dark age tradition, making her way up the ranks of the church the only way she could? As the Da Vinci Code argues, sometimes art is a more intriguing source than history. Come with us to St. Peter's Square, the Basilica, the very heart of the Catholic Church. altar carvings by none other than Gian Lorenzo Bernini in the 1600s, the favorite sculptor of all of the Vatican, indeed all of Italy. Look closely at the base of the columns. There, a woman with a papal crown over her head, and around her shield, symbols that evoke the female anatomy. And there's not just one figure of her, eight of them. They seem to be telling a dramatic story. But what could it be? And not far away, is there a storeroom with a secret? And can we possibly get access up there behind the doors to see what they say is a chair designed to prove there's no female pope ever again? More when we return. Once again, Diane Sawyer. So a young woman decides to don a monk's robe and become a scholar, a teacher in the chaos of Dark Age Rome. Possible? Believable? It's not as if it hasn't happened before in real life and from stories in every culture on the planet. What my father learned and his father before him will be there for my eyes and ears. I can walk through the forest of the trees. Of the movie is Yentl, a story with its roots in an old Jewish folktale about a rabbi's daughter in Poland who disguises herself as a boy so that she can study religion. And here, a story recorded in an old poem from the 5th century in China, the Han Dynasty. Disney made a children's movie about Mulan, who takes her father's place and goes to war disguised as a man. And we know there was Joan of Arc in her armor in the 1400s. And look closely at these soldiers from the American Civil War. They are, in fact, women who bound their breasts and disguised themselves so that they could march to war often with husbands or fiancés. They sometimes stuck on beards or mustaches. Sometimes commanders would test them, throwing apples at them to see if they would try to catch them in non-existent aprons. Throughout history and in every culture, there are hundreds of verified accounts of women risking their lives to live with the power and possibilities of a man and often paying the ultimate price. Like the girl said to have reigned as Pope undetected for two and a half years. It is written that Joan was at the pinnacle of her power when something very human brought about her tabloid downfall on a narrow street near the Colosseum. So here we are at a street that looks like an ordinary crossroads today, but the story goes that this intersection is the scene of one of the greatest scandals in history. Go back to those ancient manuscripts penned by the scholars over the centuries. They write, two and a half years into her reign, Pope Joan made an ordinary three-mile trip to the Church of the Lateran in Rome, right up the hill. Our guide, Italian scholar Claudio Rendina, who recounts the tale handed down through the centuries. The procession came from Via de Sante Quattro, went on Via de Quartetti, 
and then continued on the big street of San Giovanni, as it was called at the time. She was the center of the papal procession, taking the straightest route between the Lateran and St. Peter's. Pope Joan was allegedly heading back to the Vatican, three and a half miles, may have been mounting a horse, when suddenly she felt a sharp pain, and then another sharp pain. Contractions. Contractions? Something unimaginable seemed to be happening. The climb was making the Pope go into labor. The Holy Father was having a baby. The middle of the street, the Pope had a baby. She hadn't kept a good count of the weeks or months, as they say nowadays, and gave birth right there. And then shock and horror, and then the story gets very confused because some of the records say she was killed and her child was killed right on the spot. Other records say she was sent to a convent and that her son grew up and later was Bishop of Ostia. A horrified crowd would have realized her deception. And as you heard, stories vary. She was stoned to death. She was tied to the tail of a horse and dragged. Renaissance artists tried to capture the scene. In the varying accounts, the child lives, the child dies. But in most of them, Pope Joan perishes on that street. And even doubters acknowledge that there is compelling evidence that for decades, Subsequent popes believed that this intersection was the shameful reminder of a ghastly blow to the church. Romans called it the Vicus Papisa, the street of the female pope. Well, we have records from the 1140s that say we are now changing the route. Instead of going that way, we're going to go this way. It is documented that for more than 100 years, the popes made a point of avoiding this more direct path between the Lateran Church and the Vatican, taking a detour. In 1144, they started taking the jog to the right on a bigger street. The prestigious medieval historian Polonus talks about it. Quote, the Lord Pope always turns aside from the street because of abhorrence of the event. And there is a record that the 15th century papal master of ceremonies, a man named John Burchard, was reprimanded because he steered Pope Innocent VIII down the taboo vicus papisa. And did that most revered sculptor, Bernini, decide literally to etch this incident in stone? Come with us back again to the heart of the Catholic Church, St. Peter's Basilica. Inside, look once more at the columns of the altar. Remember Bernini's sculpture of a woman with a papal crown above her head. Remember the multiple carvings? Is the story now clear? These are the photographs showing the base of Bernini's sculpture. At the top of this crest, the face of a woman, which you can see better in the following photos, which represent the phases of conception and delivery of this woman. First phase is conception, then we see the face, always more tortured, of a woman who is at the point of delivery. Phases, I would say, dramatic, as can be the pain of birth, until the eighth one, in which we find a baby, just born. So is this Bernini's version of Joan? And if so, how did her story then recede into the mist so completely? When we come back, scholars weigh in. And can they explain that most perplexing clue of all? One of the most bizarre mysteries surrounding Pope Joan. So what about the strangest object of all? the massive marble chair where popes were crowned. Was it used, as some say, to make sure there's no female pope ever again? Primetime continues after this from our ABC. Now, Diane Sawyer. So now you've seen the Bernini carvings, the manuscripts, and heard about the bust in the papal gallery in Siena. But is it possible that all this is just leading to a sort of dark age urban legend? There are people who laugh at the idea of Pope Joan. In fact, that's now the official position of the Catholic Church. The modern Catholic Church will tell you the legend of Pope Joan is ridiculous, not worth talking about. And legions of scholars everywhere agree that Joan's story is just that, a story. I don't see any proof or an indication that she really did exist. There was never a female pope. No, it's not true. One thing is certain, go to Rome today. You can't find her. 
For instance, this is a Basilica of St. Paul, and there's a medallion here for every pope since Peter, but not one mention, not one hint of a Pope Joan. She's definitely not on the official tour. But we wondered, how do all these scholars dismiss the documents, the church chronicles? Well, they say the earliest of them was in fact written by a rural monk in France 400 years after Pope Joan would have died. In his actual story, he actually puts a little note in the margins that said this needs to be verified, and it's not actually ever verified. The, the very concept of reality, of historical, factual reality, was completely different from that that we have now. But wait, wasn't one of the chronicles written by the foremost historian of his time, Martin Polonus, advisor to the Pope himself? He was the one who added the details, like she was led to Athens dressed in the clothes of a man, and he dates her reign to 855 AD. And he writes it as fact, not mm -hmm. conjecture, not at all. He writes it exactly along with all the other stories of of the day. But scholar Claudio Rendina says Pope Joan is just a legend, and it's clear if you study Polonus's Latin. His writings are based on his personal impression, I would say, in some way. He says Polonus actually writes, it is said there was a female pope. He was a very careful man who went to some trouble to correct other errors in the papal record, but who left this story in. Valerie Hotchkiss argues that, in fact, the Polonus account may have been added to his documents after he died. But how does she explain the 500 other chronicles? She says monks were like medieval copying machines and just passed on Polonus's mistake. And they're picking it up from each other and changing it and embellishing it. Why do you think for those hundreds of years it was perpetuated? What, some 500 mm -hmm. different... Uh, duplicates of sure. what Martin Polonus wrote. Obviously, it intrigued people in the Middle Ages. This was, this was a, uh, almost like an Agatha Christie, and it intrigued them. We are back in Rome with the former head of the Vatican's secret archives, Monsignor Charles Burns. When we talk about the secret archives, are we talking about rooms and rooms and rooms? Describe it for us. Well, there are, there are certainly over 100 rooms in the, in the Vatican Secret Archive. We have over 100 kilometers of documentation. Is there anything in them about a Pope Joan, a Pope Giovanni Angelico? Nothing. No, there's nothing. The Monsignor points out there are coins that prove that Pope Leo IV of 847 was followed immediately by Pope Benedict III of 855 no relic of any Pope John Anglicus in between. And he says there are papers signed by Benedict III dated just a few months after Pope Leo died. We know it goes Leo IV, Benedict III, Nicholas I. We know that there's really no contention about the order of popes from about the third century on. So there's no place for Joan in the ninth century. But it is a fact, isn't it, that all those popes avoided the scandalous street, the Vicus Papisa, Probably, Probably there were some popes who actually even believed the story. Most likely, given the time period, a pope would have preferred to just avoid such a situation. But we continue to ask, what about those other clues? The centuries-old tarot cards. We're told that this picture is more likely to be the portrait of a woman named Manfreda, who once declared herself pope in a kind of heresy that got her burned at the stake. And from there, we turn back to those mysterious carvings of a female face by Bernini in St. Peter's Basilica. The Pope's hat, the birth of a baby, well-known Bernini authority, John Nicholson. Uh, the story is this was a favorite niece of the Pope who was having a very difficult pregnancy. And uh, when the Pope commissioned Bernini, the Pope promised to dedicate it, among other things, as a thank offering if his niece uh, delivered the child safely. But does it really make sense that the church would have placed the image of a pope's niece at the center of the holiest place in the city? Mary Malone thinks not. I tend to believe that there actually was a woman who just needed to study and then did it so well that they made her a pope. The Da Vinci Code has made conspiratorialists of all of us, but is it possible that the church rearranged dates and was able to disappear her because of the unsavory episode. 
everything is possible, but I don't think there really would have been any incentive on the part of the church to do this. But the people on both sides of the debate about Joan agree on one thing. Her story was often repeated in a period when the medieval and Renaissance church decided to try to bring women under control. By the Middle Ages, two groups of women known as Beguines and Mystics were becoming enormously popular and powerful, threatening. In fact, the music you're hearing now was written by one of those female mystics, Hildegard von Bingen, who still has her own section at Tower Records. Hildegard of Bingen, who's become well known now, was also a medical doctor, was a composer, created church music, created drama, wrote and uh, instructed popes and kings, played a significant role in politics. Thousands of these women began to appear in cities of the Roman Empire like Cologne and, and Paris and uh, in the Netherlands and, and in northern Germany generally, and we don't know where they came from and um, really terrified the church because they went around saying things like, my real me is God. Uh, and so mysticism then gave these women an access to God that was parallel to the church. In addition to the mystics, there had been the female manipulators who used sex and strategy to pull the strings behind the scenes. For instance, it's documented that in the 10th century, in this castle, a woman and her daughter had a pope murdered and were said to control the papacy through their sons and lovers for half a century. Later on, it would be called the rule of the harlots. So 11th century, 12th century. So there was a sense that women were kind of almost getting on top. And so the crackdown came, and it was relentless. We have married priests and married bishops all the way into the 12th century. Pope after Pope began to insist on enforcing celibacy, get the women away. If a priest would not give up his wife, then the bishop would sell her into slavery. Women who were upstanding ministers, priests, wives, suddenly became temperances, whores, and allies of the devil. Women were labeled so sinful, they could not touch sacred objects. Menstrual blood was believed to turn wine sour, to make iron rust, to infect dog bites with an incurable poison. A pregnancy and birth was considered unclean. A woman was not allowed in church for over 30 days after she'd given birth, 60 days if it was a female child to whom she gave birth. Sometimes they would think that also mirrors would lose the ability of uh, reflecting if touched by a woman uh, uh, with her period. So. The prevailing science implied that female babies were the result of a mistake. A woman was called a mass occasionatus, which means a failed, an accidental man. So it meant that if a woman was born, something had gone wrong in the whole system. That something happened in the process of the development of the embryo, either caused by humidity or caused by an east wind blowing, that the um, that in a sense the embryo didn't come to full term. To come to full term would be to be masculine, and to be feminine then was in a sense a birth defect. And so even the scholars who doubt a female pope think it's possible that the story of Joan grew out of this crackdown. Some say the story might have been invented as a perfect cautionary tale. Women, don't even think about reaching for power or you will end up like her. Giving birth on the part of Joan was the ultimate sin, the ultimate uh, horrible event that she uh, did. And therefore, the story could be one way of kind of guaranteeing that no woman actually has that kind of influence over the, over the papacy. Yet others still want the world to believe that the crackdown on women ensured the disappearance of a real Pope Joan. Certainly it is true that the church has never been reluctant to expunge information that has been embarrassing to it, and frankly, without any sense of wrongdoing. And as you'll see, there is one more clue even the respected scholars struggle to explain. This coronation chair, was it used to prevent another female pope? Now, that's a mighty weird custom if there was never a female pope.
From the first moment we started researching this story, it was the clue that most stunned and mystified us. And so what about the strangest object of all? It is said to be a chair designed to prove that no female ever becomes Pope again. We know that travelers wrote accounts back in the Middle Ages of a strange part of the papal coronation ceremony. They quoted Romans who told them that new popes were asked to sit on a very ancient chair that had a curious kind of opening, a chair through which a deacon could stick his hand up just enough to make sure the pope was a man, even proclaiming to the assembly, testiculos habit. That's what the Romans reportedly said. He would put his hands under the chair to verify the sex of the pope, and he would say, he has them. At the coronation, they heard the deacon come out and proclaim that he does have two large hanging ones. That was the chair that was used for centuries uh, at a particularly sacred moment of a papal coronation ceremony. We don't have an eyewitness account of a deacon reaching under to say, testiculos hobbit. Yet even serious scholars acknowledge that at one point, new popes did sit on a strange purple marble chair with a bizarre opening. We asked the Vatican if we could see this chair. They told us it's in a gallery used only for research and with apologies, we could not tape it. Though they did send us the existing Vatican Museum tape of that room, the gallery, though it doesn't show the chair. Instead, they gave us a photo. Here it is, examine it yourself. It looks like wood, but in fact, it's red purple marble. A papal throne with an opening below. If not to check the gender of the Pope, what else could explain it? Well, each of our historians had a different answer. David Dawson Vasquez says that perhaps it was just the most impressive furniture they could find. Well, because it's elaborate, it's purple, purple marble, Porphyry comes from Egypt. It was the most expensive marble of Roman times, and so it was only used for the emperor. The hole is there because it was used by the Imperial Romans, perhaps as a toilet, perhaps as a birthing chair. Doesn't matter that there's a hole there because you can still sit there and be crowned. It's very obviously a toilet seat. So the question arises, why would a toilet seat be used at a sacred moment of a papal coronation ceremony? Claudio Rendina offers a different explanation. He says it was a birthing chair, a symbol of the Pope and the Mother Church. And it, it entailed the Pope sitting on this obstetric throne, basically, a birthing throne. Per significare la Mater Ecclesia. To signify the Mother Church. So it was a, it was a female birthing chair, because that was he was the, leading the Mother Church. But used at a coronation? Yeah, but, but, but. I mean, that's very strange symbolism, isn't it, for a pope to sit on an obstetrical chair? Even Rendina agrees it's an eccentric relic. And we do have proof that by the 1500s, the newly minted Protestants, those dissenters from Catholicism, were having a field day making fun of that throne. These are actual cartoons from the time showing the pope sitting on it. Not long after this, the chair was retired. Oh, yes, I would think so. I get And along with the chair, the incendiary story of Pope Joan fades away. The manuscripts closed, the paintings and sculptures treated as curiosities. Tourists glance at a papal bus, not knowing it was once said to have been female. And traffic fills the streets where Roman tour guides sometimes remember to mention the legend of a woman who was stoned to death on this spot for her deception. So perhaps it's up to each of us to decide, was she real or a fiction that ensnared even historians of the Catholic Church? Was she just a cautionary tale? Or was she a woman like so many in history who gambled that the horizon was just the doorway to her dream? If you need further proof that the story of Pope Joan has found its way into the 21st century, just Google her. Nearly 110,000 entries pop up in 0.5 seconds, perhaps a tribute to what the ancient manuscripts called the audacity of women. 
Someone once said that myths are things that may or may not have happened, but in spirit are always true. I'm Diane Sawyer. For all of us at Primetime, Happy New Year and good night.